Geography was touting marine protected areas as the way to save the species in the ocean and move forward to sustainability. So that was 14 or 15 years ago, and I'm glad we're still talking about it. Um, maybe we'll get in a little bit to, uh, to, to progress that has been made there and uh, the look forward. Um, this is a really, really interesting issue, and, and very conveniently, the Obama administration on July 19th, so 10 days ago, actually came out with an integrated national ocean policy um, calling for a comprehensive approach to coordinate. Uh, marine management uh, in U.S. waters and coastal areas uh, and in the Great Lakes. Um, and so I think that's a wonderful springboard for us to, to start the conversation. We've got some great panelists with us today, um, so I'm going to introduce them to you before we get started. Uh, Chuck Fox is a senior advisor to the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and he focuses right now on uh, the Chesapeake Bay and the Anacostia River. Um, actually, this is not Chuck's first time at, the, at EPA. He was the water administrator. Uh, during the Clinton administration, and this morning he told me that he must have been the most progressive because uh, they spent uh, the eight intervening years undoing most of the regulations that he passed. So we're <laughs> we're glad to have him back. Um, he uh, has also has broad experience working with uh, the environmental community uh, and conservation voters generally. So we're excited to have Chuck on this panel. Um, Right next to me is uh, Jim Barry. Uh, Jim is a marine ecologist with uh, a, a set of interests that span uh, undersea robotics to understanding fossil fuel uh, effect on ecosystems from the surface to the deep sea. So I think he's pretty busy right now dealing with some of the more direct fossil fuel emissions uh, uh, in the ocean. Um, he has published over 100 scientific papers, uh, and he helps inform Congress and the public on all the issues that are pertaining to the marine environment, from ocean acidification uh, to climate change. Uh, he seems to have some very strong views about marine spatial planning in the US, and uh, we're excited to have him on, on the panel today. Um, I think many of you know that Sylvia Earle was originally scheduled to be on this panel, and somebody did ask me if she was okay, so I want to let you know she's just she's on a flight to Japan, so I think uh, she's there right now, and she was very disappointed not to be able to be here today to speak for the fish, as she would put it. Um, but Andrea Neal has graciously agreed to step in uh, to the empty spot on the panel, and we're really glad to have her. Uh, I, she was on another panel that I moderated. I in incorrectly introduced her, but I'll do it correctly today. She is the queen of ocean trash. <laughs> um, she is a principal investigator for Project Kaise. She's the president of Blue Ocean Sciences, and she's also an advisor to Jean-Michel Cousteau's Ocean Future Society. And she works mostly on uh, marine debris issues, nanotoxicity, and all of the unseen perpetrators of bad things in the ocean. So uh, we're very excited that Andrea is going to be joining us today. And on my far left is Mark Gold, who is president of the environmental group Heal the Bay, which is a California-based NGO. Um, he's worked over the last 20 years in the field of ocean uh, coastal protection and water pollution, um, and uh, he started Heal the Bay's Beach Report Card, um, and he is also works with California's National Estuary Program, which I think is one of the local on-the-ground efforts to, to, to protect, to, to work with the public and other constituencies to put in place a program to protect the marine environment. So with that introduction, um, we will get going with Jim. Uh, I just, you know, I wanted you to give us a little bit of context of what we're talking about when we're talking about ocean issues, bad impacts, and how we can address those through marine spatial planning. Well, thank you. First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and the Aspen Institute and the organizers for inviting us all here. I think I have this one right here. Um, so to get to this issue, um, we had a very interesting and lively discussion this morning, but one of the things that we came up with is something that Sylvia would probably start with, and that is that we have been taking way too many fish, we've been perturbing systems, pollution, all of the things you've heard about in terms of per perturbations to the ocean and degradation of ocean resources. There has been, over the last 10 years, some development of commissions like the Pew Ocean Commission that looked at the conditions of the oceans and found and ocean policy. and. For, and they, they cited the Stratton Commission, who in 1969, and I just have one short, very short quote from this, the Stratton Commission was the first real, real or most recent look at our national ocean policy. And at that time, they recommended a full and wise use of marine resources. And then it's basically a frontier with untapped resources that we need to exploit. And I think we've done a very good job at the full use, but I'm not sure we've done a very good job at the wise use of our resources. And the report from the inter, I've forgotten, interagency working group on, uh, on oceans 
came out with their recommendations a week or so ago that that uh, basically said we need to protect our resources for our children and they have some guiding principles that really say that the way that we need to do this is to have sustainable ecosystems and healthy diverse resilient ecosystems so that we can continue to recover the ecosystem services that we depend upon and at the same time balance those with economic needs, shipping and security. And they outline a plan in this report to say here's what we need that is based in ecosystem management and includes a large element of marine spatial planning so that we define for areas of the coast, the oceans and the Great Lakes what is a suitable use of that environment that always looks at this backdrop of the maintenance of ecosystem health and that will make sure that our children and their children have those resources in the future. Now there's a lot of, we had a lot of discussion and we may now about actually how you're going to implement that, but I think this is a great thing. And the reason I think that is that up to this point, what we've done, and following from the Strat Stratton Commission report, is we've gone out and just attacked and used the ocean as a frontier. Let's drag nets here, let's do this, let's do that. Don't worry about coastal inputs, pollution, coastal degradation, urbanization, and everything else. And when there's a problem, oh my gosh, marine mammals are in trouble. The Marine Mammal Act, the Clean Water Act, um, the Coastal Zone Protection Act, and we've dealt with ocean issues in an ad hoc basis with sort of a fragmentation of authority and both in space and in among um, agencies so that we don't have any team moving toward what we see as the goal of protecting those resources. This report start, is a great starting point to, that basically says we've all got to get on the same page the basic premise is let's protect those resources and here's a plan that will allow us as a nation to see what our goals are and then have an implementation strategy that includes things like marine spatial planning. So what does what marine spatial planning involve? Well, at the root of it, again, I said is protecting e ecosystems and that includes a lot of the details of maintaining species diversity and habitat heterogeneity and making sure that the ecosystem services or the connection be for populations so that at a location the populations will do fine. And I don't know that, that we need to get into that here, but we can talk about it later. That's the well, early back. And you, act you, you anticipated, in a way, my next question without even knowing what it was. But you know, we have, there's a litany of agencies. You have NOAA, Interior, EPA, the Navy, the Department of State, um, to some extent, depending on if it's a fish resource that is uh, been modified, uh, you know, food security uh, agencies. You have the National Marine Sanctuaries Program, the, the Coastal Zone Management Act, the National Fisheries Programs, the National Estuary Program, the Clean Water Act. You have all of these things going on, so it, it makes sense that it's taken us this long to to get to something comprehensive. Yet, you know, your that Stratton Commission quote is this from a long time ago. Why there have been many stops and starts in the U.S. to get to the place we are now. Why do you think it's really taken this long for everyone to get together and say we really need to look at this holistically? Well, it would be my personal view of this because I don't think I really know why it's taken so long. But my guess would be that the will, that the desire to protect ocean resources is a given. Nobody really would in their right mind say, oh, I'd prefer if that was just a, a parking lot. And so that, it's not surprising people want to protect resources. The difficulty is in the political process, I would expect, and Chuck can probably talk a lot more about that, of why we can't get through some things, because there are competing needs. We want to pull resources that are in conflict with, or dump um, coastal pollution that are in conflict with maintaining those ecosystems. So Mark, you are working in California in a, in a local area that is trying to put together a plan to protect its estuary and coastal areas. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? and apply it to this. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, this was the final oceans policy and two thirds of it's on coastal and marine spatial planning. So um, the, the policy doesn't really go into depth on anything other than that. So that's one of the reasons it's pretty timely that we're having this discussion right now. There are some big advantages to it um, in that it gets federal and state agencies to better coordinate and communicate, which is obviously a big problem. 
Um, they're, centralized, they're calling for centralized data management right now. If you want scientific information or GIS layers, they're spread all over the place between various different agencies or academic institutions and those sorts of things. That's all positive um, and, and something that we need to do. As you heard from Jim, um, finally moving to an ecosystem management-based approach. Um, is something that's been talked about for a long time. Hopefully this will move it from rhetoric to reality, which would be a, a good thing. Um, and it focuses on neglected parts of the ocean that um, despite all the planning, for example, that occurs in California um, with our Marine Life Protection Act, where we're setting up marine, marine protected areas in the state of California, as well as um, uh, we have our Coastal Act, um, which is uh, part, works part and parcel with the uh, Coastal Zone Management Act um, with local coastal planning. Um, there have been some, some pros that have occurred on that, but really nothing you know, all the way out to the EEZ, and that's obviously pretty critical. Now, I've had the opportunity to work in our own local area as part of the National Estuary Program um, with the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission. And uh, what's interesting, on a much smaller geographic scale, it's identical in, in the same sorts of things um, in the National Estuary Program, if you're familiar with that. There's something around 35 estuaries throughout the, the nation that are part of that that have been in place for around 20 or so years at this point. And it was the same thing, you know, let's take ecosystem management approach, let's deal with water pollution issues, let's um, um, protect uh, beneficial uses um, for people within the region, all of those other various different things. We spent about five years within the area working with the, um, uh, the, the EPA, the federal government, um, various different agencies, state agencies, local agencies, all getting together, meeting once a month, set up a technical advisory committee. We wrote a pretty cool restoration plan. There was about 250 recommendations within that plan. It didn't get quite to zoning, but definitely talked about um, things like, you know, what are, what, are, what are the most important parts of the ecosystems, which habitats are threatened, all of those other various different things. Um, signed by Carol Browner, um, signed by uh, then Governor Wilson. Um, so, you know, had all the accolades, that sort of thing. The reality is, the planning is sort of like the honeymoon phase. Everybody gets into it, you know, they're newlyweds, they have fun, they write a really good plan, everyone gets excited about it. It doesn't cost nearly as much as implementation, which usually is three orders of magnitude or more um, uh, planning. And so we have a really great plan for Santa Monica Bay. And I'd say we've implemented, implemented here we are 20 years later, 10% um, of that plan because it's strictly voluntary in nature. And that's, that I think is a, a cautionary tale in how we're looking at this. We're now we're talking about nine regions, you know, where one region is the entire west coast of the United States. So that's kind of a big thing. Or the entire Pacific Island region. So now we're talking about regions where you have multi-state jurisdictions. Um, Chuck obviously can talk a lot about that because of his Chesapeake experience and how do you get you know, four or five states to work together to solve a problem. Um, and so we're going to try to do that at that level. So conceptually, I think it's great. What I'm really worried about is, and I think you see it with all the, the, the squishy language that's throughout this um, plan, um, through this policy, is how do you actually create any serious accountability on the plan? Is there going to be a decision-making body that um, is going to decide how you're going to change shipping lanes because of whale migration patterns? I mean, are we really going to get to that point? That would be a big, big change from where we are right now, and it's not even working at the more local level. Um, so to think that it's going to work on, on that level, um, we're really missing a lot of information. These are plans that should be developed within the next five years. Um, and uh, unless there's really strong assurances in some sort of regulatory format that goes with it, I'm just afraid we're going to end up with the same sort of thing, which is a great plan. There will be some good things that come out of it, no doubt about it. I mean, if we do nothing other than improve coordination and communications and database management, that's a good thing. Um, but from the standpoint of really, truly reaching that vision of true ecosystem management in an effective manner, I'm a little skeptical. So, Chuck, this is a great segue for you because you've worked both at, at the regional, local and regional level with Chesapeake Bay. You've worked on programs that are at the federal level. And I know at your, your work at, with, with Pew, you worked uh, in the international arena. And the ocean international arena is a funny one because we use aspects of uh, the law of the sea to define uh, the areas in which we manage the ocean. But the United States actually is not technically a signatory to that treaty. And so we're, we're caught in the middle on, on international uh, high seas jurisdictions, certainly in areas like the Arctic, which are going to be opening up. So what are your thoughts on, on how we can integrate these different spatial scales and in, in the future for global working together on this issue? 
Um, the, the challenges of governance in environmental issues generally is, is huge, and I think that's what we're really talking about here. You know, you go back in time, and, and I think this is a, still a question for our society. You go back in time to the early 70s, and we had these media-specific laws. You know, it was a Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Um, different points in time, we had the, what we called sector-based management, where you realized that a, you know, a power plant or a steel mill would have impacts on air, water, and waste, and you needed to look at it holistically. Most of our government agencies are managed and structured in a matrix sense around functions, whether you're the permitting, the enforcement, the science operation. And what we're talking about here is place-based management, which really kind of came into the fore with the National Estuary Program. The 1987 amendments to the Clean Water Act was the first kind of institutional ratification of that. And my experience has been that the environment, no matter how you choose to cut it and manage it, it's all about matrix management. And at some level, you're going to have to integrate the places, the sectors, the media, the issues. And this really becomes a challenge at the international level, um, you know, which is, of course, where most of the oceans are. Um, uh, I did a lot of work on fisheries. And again, I'm a couple years old. But at the time, there were literally 50 different international f fisheries management organizations. Uh, some of them were structured around places um, like uh, Cam Camelar down in the Southern Ocean, or NAFO, or NEAF up in the North Atlantic. These were place-based uh, fisheries management organizations that had complete jurisdiction over all the fishing in those places. Others were species specific, like the Tuna Commission or the Whaling Commission. Um, and then you had yet other kind of fragments and weird structures. Um, at the international level, you have the London Dumping Convention, the IMO over vessels. You've got the Deep Seabed Mining Authority, um, the Law of the Sea Treaty, of course. We have all of these different governance models that collectively are not capable yet of producing what we would think of as coordinated, comprehensive ocean management by any stretch of the imagination. And at an international level, the thought of amending the law of the sea at this point to try and do that, I mean, it's a non-starter. Um, some people have been talking about that for two, three years up in New York at the UN, and they're basically talking about maybe some technical implementing amendments to it, but I think this is a multi-year uh, conversation that probably won't yield anything. Uh, to me, the biggest challenge for, and how I've tried to focus a lot of my work is, let's figure out what are the most important problems on the ocean and Let's just focus on solving those problems. There's only limited political capital in this world, and can we figure out what it is we really need to fix? And rather than spend too much time on these very important questions of governance, let's just try and get down to solving some problems. And do you think there is a consensus on a, a, a top tier list of, of what some of those problems are? It is, but any time you do this, you always run the risk of um, alienating people who don't think those are top on the list. But I'll tell you, if you were to ask any scientists to rank them, I bet most of them would come up in terms of ocean issues with overfishing and or in destructive fishing practices more generally. It is, it is unbelievable what's happening, particularly outside the U.S. waters. You guys are doing an excellent job of segueing me to my next questions without even knowing it because, you know, so you've Fisheries is extraction at a place, so a marine protected area that is defined as a place-based uh, zone, you know, you make sense. You can, you can certainly talk about managing the scallop fishery. You can see where the edge is between the no-fish zone and, and the fish zone, and you can actually see them because they don't move that much. You can see the, the, the population in, increasing there. So that's, it, it, it's, it's a, it, I know there's been some success already shown uh, using marine protected areas to increase fish stocks. but question for you, Andrea, is that how do you deal with these externality problems like the toxic in the environment that they don't pay any attention to any sort of boundary, so you're going to set this protected area to manage for these particular fisheries resources. They may start uh, coming back, but you've got all this toxic pollution coming in from these dispersed sources. So I'd like to just comment a bit on my, my colleague's comment. I don't believe that we can separate out issues where, with ocean health. They are so interconnected, and the diversity of the problems are huge. We have to face our problems with the ocean like a network, like it is. If you look at one piece of the puzzle, you're going to miss the rest of the puzzle, and you may cause an extinction event just by ignoring the rest of the puzzle. And I, I think that's a very important part to think about as a system, system biology, the entire thing and how it works together. As for what we see with environmental pollutants, it's very hard to regulate many environmental pollutants that we can't see or understand. Think about nanoparticles, things that are under 100 nanometers. Most people have no idea how small that is, and most of our filtration systems within our sewage outfalls have no ability to deal with nanoparticles. Medicines 
contaminants from medicines. We, we have no way to regulate and control these getting into our environment. So when we think about the issues of marine protected areas, I think they are vastly important because they are not only just looking at these individual topics, they are trying to protect it as a whole. But we do need to increase what we understand in our technology development for understanding what's there. We need to also look into centralized information centers. So using the intellect and using the technology that we have to say, hey, I know how to do this. Do you know how to do it? And connecting in a Facebook type manner. There's a group that does this in California called the Ocean Media Network through UCSB, and they're trying to do just that. They're trying to create a Facebook mechanism for scientists. So if we have questions about MPAs or if we have environmental disasters that occur like oil spills, we can get together within two weeks and mobilize as a scientific community looking at the problem as a whole, not as an individualized system. Um, going from that to a, a, an issue as broad as climate change, um, I know that the, the, this new ocean policy and marine spatial planning generally you know, wants to look at conservation, economic activity, any user complex and sustainable use. Is there, does it, does it interface well with, with talking about the long, longer term effects of climate on the marine ecosystem or is that something that is, is going to have to sort of come in marine national ocean policy 2.0? Uh, I think yes and no. Um, a, a global problem like climate change or ocean acidification make it difficult for marine spatial planning um, because if the whole system's going to change because it's becoming more acidic, for example, then it, it may not matter what you do in terms of marine spatial planning. It, it may be ineffective in terms of maintaining ecosystems. Yet at the same time, if you know, if we can predict with some reasonable certainty how things are going to warm or how much, you may be able to incorporate the temporal change in what you expect temporal change to be in conditions with, within your planning process. So that if, if we know, for example, that tuna are going to move further north, you may make sure that the zoning for some area to the north is, is available for that. I, I think that's something that's going to be, have to worked out, be worked out. Very difficult process, and Mark and Chuck have said that how you move from this grand, wonderful idea, let's protect the oceans in essence, to actually implementing something that will be functional and effective, that's, that's a very large hurdle for us. And I think, in part, it's because we have never had a national ocean policy. Once our children and their children grow up, and who, who knows, it may take that long, before the public consciousness realizes that the ecosystem services we want require the maintenance of these ecosystems. Before their, my 10-year-old is 30, I expect that there's going to be a fair amount more degradation, and hopefully that will motivate people to action. Overfishing, I would agree, is the single most problematic area right now. It's, it's immediate, but if you integrate that over the long term, there are some things that are happening now that might cause even worse problems in the long run. We can't let those go. I think we have to have sort of a multi-tiered approach. We've got to go ahead and have this national program, have a national view of what has to be done, not only for our coastal waters and economic zone and Great Lakes. We have to think about it in, over the globe, I think, because at least for some of these marine populations, they have larvae that are going to go outside, our, outside those zones anyway. So you have, to, for ecosystem-based management, it's, it's much broader scope. But we can tackle, I think if we as a, a nation really decided let's solve the overfishing problem, we could do it. We haven't had the will to do that, and it's the political will that we haven't had. But that, in part, is driven by what emails and texts and Twitters people are sending to their legislators. And so we need everybody out there saying, you know, it pisses me off, just like we heard from uh, Chris Johns about the letters that he's received as an editor saying, what the hell are you doing, you know, putting in a climate change picture? We need all of our legislators receiving a zillion Twitters a day complaining about inaction on overfishing or other issues. I don't, you have, both of you guys have much better experience in how that, the machinations of, of the political system work, but that's, that's my view of how it might I, help. I, I wanted to take a, you know, obviously, you know, the opening salvo, so to speak, you know, I, I was sort of assigned the, the implementation issue. and. Um, that being said, I mean, this is Aspen, right? So you can't just rag on something. You've got to come up with some solution one way or the other. And, and the reality is, is that um, this is something that, that, that Chuck brought up earlier um, in, in at breakfast this morning is that 
we have some pretty amazing environmental laws that are already in place. Um, and um, the Clean Water Act doesn't stop um, just at our shores. It, it includes, you know, all of the waters of the United States um, and better be a pretty critical part of any sort of planning that's going to occur. The Coastal Zone Management Act does not um, go uh, all the way out past state waters. That's something that looking at it as a potential model on how the Coastal Zone Management Act, there's a lot of good stuff and bad stuff, and I can spend three hours talking about it, which I sometimes bore my students at UCLA on, um, on this sort of thing. But um, the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, from the standpoint of assigning you know, which resources really need to be protected and how, how they're going to go about doing it and what those policies are, um, and being able to control um, uh, various different um, uses um, within the coastal zone uh, area uh, has been somewhat effective in the state of California. Maybe not, you know, throughout the entire United States. Obviously, we have our Coastal Act, which makes a big difference. The point being is whether you add Magnuson Stevens or whether you add any other, there's a lot of federal laws out there right now that have an incredible number of tools that need to be integral to this marine spatial planning because. If the whole thing is put together and is strictly voluntary as opposed to actually using the tools that are already out there from the standpoint of providing compliance assurance or, dare I say it, enforcement, um, that, that makes all the difference in the entire world. So it's not just the politics of the situation. It's not just is there enough money to do things right. It's whether or not there's the will to actually use those legal tools that are, are there already um, um, and across the various different resources that need to be protected to get to ecosystem management in an effective manner. So Chuck, I guess you as the, can tell us a little bit more. You know, it was July 19th, this national ocean policy was put out. You know what's 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 what happens next, and how how does whatever that process is, uh, agencies getting together to to actually put the the details on that plan, figuring out where the that they are actually funded to implement that, how does that all happen, so, uh, in a time frame that makes this uh, an issue that continues into whatever the next administration is? It's not a partisan issue. It's 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 a planning and management issue. And how do how do we move forward with it in a non political way now that this is out there? The hope is that um, over the next five years, which is the time frame that I think is outlined in the in the executive order, um, is that we will develop these comprehensive plans that will be regionally based, regionally focused, and we will have, as Mark described for Santa Monica Bay from the early 1980s, a blueprint as to what do we do, need to do to achieve the goals of the executive order. Now, this this policy is very significant. It, is, it does say for the first time that the primary goal for the United States government is to protect and conserve America's ocean. And that is distinct from some of the other statutory mandates that we have. And so this is a new policy, and it is very significant in that regard. And so the hope is that we're going to now know much more precisely what it is we need to do to achieve those goals. Aaron, you work with, well, you have an NGO and you work with a lot of NGOs. Um, part of this, I think, may be building an ocean constituency among the general public. Uh, how important have you found that? To, the, to your work and any of the work that you've, uh, that's going on in California on ocean protection there, and how, do, how might that apply to, to this at the national level? One of the main things I've learned in the last few years as I've stepped out of the lab and have tried to do more educational outreach is that your government agencies and your government officials, you can go talk to them. They're there for you to talk and discuss with them and to sit down and have a conversation. I never knew that before. It sounds a little bit ignorant, but as a scientist, I was never trained in that. But I also realized through these conversations, there was a distinct lack of understanding in what I was trying to communicate. And so communication structures and developing communication structures where you take hard scientific data and facts and translate it in ways that policymakers can understand it, the general public can understand it, everyone can understand it, is so important for how we create policies and how we generalize movements, movements of people who care about the environment. People aren't going to care about some scientist up here going blah, blah, blah. They're going to care about someone that they can relate to. They're going to care about something they understand. And if you put it in a way that they understand it, they are going to care about it. So I don't know, most of you might have attended the plenary session we had before, and I think a lot of the conversation there was about sort of always thinking outside the box, not just looking for a, a unique solution, but really just looking for another way uh, of managing this. Um, do, do you feel, Mark, that the, the, what you guys have already put in uh, for your uh, national estuary program 
is there and it's just really a question of political will and, and public will to get it implemented or do you, do you think that maybe we need to go back and retool some of the, the planning we've really done to come up with some new ideas and see if those can catch on in a little bit different way? I, I think the plan um, which we do update about every, I don't know, five years or so. I mean, we recently did that. The plan's not the issue. The, the, for example, you know, an area that um, we focus a lot on as an organization is, is stormwater pollution and the impact of stormwater pollution, whether it's you know, public health, is it safe to swim, or um, the marine debris issues, or those sorts of things. And so um, our area of the nation is sort of the uh, hot spot, if you will, for a very unpopular method of cleaning up water, which is using a section of the Clean Water Act um, that requires site-specific standards to be developed, and you clean up to those standards, and it changes the regulatory framework completely. It's the dreaded four-letter total maximum daily loads. And um, so that's a part of, the, of the, um, the, the plan now, is, okay, how are we going to tackle trash or metals or nutrients or, you know, all, all the various different issues that have caused impairment in those water bodies. Um, so there are recommendations throughout that plan that say we need to do that. It's still about the most contentious issue you're ever going to get into, ever. You know, because it's, it's hardcore regulatory work that's going to greatly change the way, I mean, not only the, we deal with pollution from the standpoint of um, pollution reduction and treatment and that sort of thing, but a lot of things that we've been hearing about sustainability. I mean, it's driving the low impact development movement um, in Southern California right now um, because it's saying, look, the best way to deal with stormwater pollution is to infiltrate it into the ground and not let you pick up the pollutants to begin with and you get groundwater augmentation, you get flood control and these other benefits. So I'm using just that example to illustrate that it really comes back to you know, the political well and whether or not people are willing to push hard enough at the regulatory side or the elected official side to say, you know what, we did this plan, it's going to require each and every one of us to be accountable for implementing that plan, and just having your name next to um, uh, some sort of action is not true accountability. Um, and whether or not you use accountability in a manner of basically saying, I'm pointing out this sanitation districts for not doing what they promised to do in 1995 and putting out an annual report that does that sort of thing, yeah, you can sort of shame them and that's going to that's gonna help a little bit and, and you can do part of it, but you need to use all the various different tools, including the regulatory ones, to make it happen. I, I, I would I just, excuse me for jumping in on this, Sarah, but, um, you know, I think as we look to all of these challenges we face in our country on any one of these issues, it's all about what are the new social norms that we need. We know from a water pollution standpoint, we can treat stormwater runoff. We don't have the social norms such that everybody is not going to have their gutter come connected to the, to, the, to the street, and in fact, they're not going to treat it. We know in the context of ocean that we probably shouldn't be going after forage fish at the bottom of the food chain and using those for reduction fisheries to feed salmon with horrible efficiency ratios. We know we shouldn't be bottom trawling in the deep sea with huge gear that destroys deep sea corals. We have a lot of these answers. The question really is, how do we make them happen? How do we create a new social norm that this is, in fact, how we do business, much more reflective of the environment? And as Mark says, the regulatory tools and environment is tried and true. We have catalytic converters on cars today. Or we have a social norm that our cars are going to pollute a whole lot less than otherwise. And I think this is some of our real challenges. How do we find ways of getting these new social norms for the oceans? Regulation is part of it. Incentives might be other part of it. But we, we have to come up with these remedies if we're going to succeed. And I'd like to comment on that briefly because I think it's, it, it takes the public, and I said I'd like everybody to Twitter. I've never, what are they, I've, I don't even know how to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you tweet. <laughs> tweet. Um, anyway. Someone's Twitter um, right now. <laughs> it's very difficult to motivate people about the ocean because most people look at the ocean and if it's blue and it doesn't smell bad, it must be fine. And I really think that's about it. You don't have to go much further in terms of satisfying most of the public. The Clean Air Act was easier because I remember growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, you couldn't see the hills. And it pisses people off when you can't see the hills, so they write letters. And they couldn't tweet then, but they could, they could send snail mail. So I don't know how we do that, but this national ocean policy does call for more science to generate a better understanding of what's going on and more public education, which hopefully will give our children better understanding and appreciation of how ecosystem services actually are linked to the ocean, so that they will tweet. I'm still, 
you know, I'll be optimistic about it, but uh, it's easy for me to have a couple glasses of wine and get a little more pessimistic. <laughs> I just want to make a, a comment. One of the things that I've found doing outreach beyond my scientific work is that people get really depressed if you come at them with the gloom and doom. And I often get the question asked to me, well, Andrea, you know all these things. You know, how do you go day by day? And I tell people, well, you know, if it gets so bad that I think we're going to have an extinction event, you're going to see me run to an island and surf the rest of my life. So if you see me take off and no longer see me in the public, that's where I'm at. But coming to that, when we talk about marine protected areas and spatial planning, I think those are one of our positive points when we talk about ocean legislation. We have positive impact and scientific data that proves that these work. In our own coastal islands, in, in the Channel Islands, we see that 12 of the 14 fish species that they look at that are used by the commercial fisheries are more prevalent and have higher biomass within those marine protected areas than outside of them. We find that three of those have three percent, a three-fold increase than inside that marine protected area instead of outside of it. So they do work. And I know that uh, many of you this morning said that you felt that this national ocean policy was a beacon of hope. Um, at the same time, I think that this issue is not uh, on people's top 10 emergent environmental issues list. If you ask them, they see a blue ocean, they go to many restaurants and it's an all you can eat shrimp bar kind of thing and they don't understand why, why do you need to manage this? That This seems to be working quite well. The Gulf of Mexico situation with the oil spill is a very obvious uh, you know, counterpoint to that, but that, that, that's a huge as yeah. catastrophe or beyond that, but how do you how do, how do we raise this issue without alarming people to the point that they want to back off and they, they don't want to listen to it, but how do, you, how do you make them feel that it's important and yet that there's a process in place to actually move this to a successful you outcome know what, in the future? I, one of the things I think has been interesting is it's, it's clearly not a one-size-fits-all. I mean, we, being a Southern California person, I see surge in the here. You know, trying to sell people on protecting the ocean is like the easiest environmental issue. You know, it's much harder to deal with air issues if you can believe it. Yeah. Yet they've done it effectively. Um, you know, uh, despite despite, but because of the Southern California lifestyle and and the connection to the ocean, it's pretty easy. To me, the most alarming thing that's happened in the Gulf isn't the disaster that's occurred, but that the local community in general, there are specific pockets, but the, there is not unified outrage on, on you know, how could this happen and we've lost seafood, which is our identity um, as a region. And it makes me realize on the spatial planning, the importance centrally in DC, you know, what's, what, what's CEQ gonna do on this? is that how are you going to make sure that because people are so different in different parts of the, the um, country and what's really important to them for the ocean um, really varies dramatically, how are you going to make sure that there's, you know, that you're not going to have some parts of the, uh, you know, some regions that are going to have really horrible plans where other regions are going to be extraordinary? You know what? I think at the end of the day, West Coast, I think we'll do pretty good. There's so many people who care about the ocean on the West Coast. That, that, that's how it is. It's not a tough sell on the West Coast to share, to convince people to care for the ocean. But in these other nine regions, it's a much larger challenge. Um, and that's why there really needs to be um, a strong focus from the um, Oceans Council to ensure that there's got to be some specific minimum levels that have to be met on these individual plans um, so that you're not going to see a situation where um, you know, when you start saying protection of marine life is co-equal with extractive uses, you've already lost. And, and that's something that I think already we've seen that, and I didn't know to quite to this some degree, and I'm part of my ignorance, um, in the Gulf. I mean, it's been sort of extraordinary to hear um, what people have said, that the, the, the anger seems to be as much on the six-month moratorium as it actually is on the actual um, oil spill disaster. Um, I, I think we need to recognize, too, that we already do marine spatial planning at some level. Right. You know, we have uh, fishery zones that are limited for various reasons, that you can't fish in certain places, you can in others. You, know, you go to Maine, they've got restrictions as to where your salmon aquaculture can happen. You've got boating restrictions all over the place, speed limits. There's, there's some amount of ocean zoning that happens already, coastal zoning much more. 
the the real challenge here gets to I think Andrea's point about uh, marine reserves and their tremendous benefit. And I think the the obvious big political challenge here going forward was going to be setting aside parts of the ocean or coastal waters that are going to be off limits to fishing in particular. And I think this is why marine spatial planning in the United States has gone much slower than anywhere else in the world. We have a very very active and politically involved uh, fishing community, and I think it started in California with some of your initial explosions in Southern California over some no fishing zones that started this um, hesitancy that we had nationwide. And so I think this is one of the real benefits of this initiative of the Obama administration is it starts us on a much more thoughtful long-term process to really understand where is it important to allow certain kinds of fishing and perhaps some places where it's not. But I think this is the, the actual real tough, tough nut in all of this going forward. Well, I wish that there was an easier way to move forward because I think it's fairly Relative to what we've done, it's, relative, it's easy to define what should be done in terms of resource protection for some stocks, for example. And establishing as an element of marine spatial planning a series of marine reserves is, in a sense, a no-brainer. Um, you should do that. You should set aside some areas, especially with the limited amount of data we have, that is abundantly showing that these are very effective in helping some populations, some populations, not all. So how do we get over that hurdle to force the issue? But I think we just don't care enough about the oceans, honestly, as a, as a society. We're, we just think as long as it's blue and we can play next to it, good enough. So I think it would be a good time to open it up for some questions from you. Go right there. I wonder what, to what extent the policy reflects lessons learned from our terrestrial ecosystems. In 1993, Clinton signed the Northwest Forest Plan first science-based ecosystem terrestrial management. Ever since, we've been fighting to keep it in place because the powerful industry in the area, the timber industry, hasn't liked it. And we have the multi-jurisdictional problem of BLM, Forest Service, state forest agencies, NOAA, US Fish and Wildlife, all with jurisdiction over the various natural resources, which has proven difficult. and. You know, everyone loves salmon in the Northwest, but we love them for different reasons, and the fisheries industry is very powerful. So, is, is there lessons learned from that? Are we truly going to get interagency cooperation and more centralized um, management to make this ecosystem management system work? What are the enforcement mechanisms? Without citizen enforcement on the terrestrial area, Northwest Forest Plan would have been gone a long time ago. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm hoping that also the Obama administration, when I hear um, Secretary Salazar say that we're going to break down the barriers between BLM and Forest Service and the various agencies on the terrestrial environment, that that's also going to extend with NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think this policy is really going to move us forward, or are we still going to have the same special interest influence on those agencies that's going to continue to impede our progress for decades. You want to comment on that? I don't know. Who wants to be optimistic? I, I can tell you there's less than a half page on enforcement in this entire document, and citizen enforcement's not in it whatsoever. So that was one of the first things I looked for, just as one short thing. But I don't, well, a, I don't want to give such a negative answer. Someone else go. As a veteran <laughs> of, of interagency um, you know, products, I, I can tell you that place-based management inherently is complicated bureaucratically, and that's just the nature of it, which is why I've, over the years, um, it's important, and we get some good benefits out of coordination. There's no question about it. You know, I, in the Chesapeake Bay right now, uh, without the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the, believe it or not, the U.S. Geological Survey, I would have horrible monitoring data that we can use to make regulatory decisions about pollution control. But from where I sit, my biggest problem in Chesapeake Bay, like overfishing, is too much nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and eutrophication in a huge dead zone. And I don't want to belittle anything else, but that's job one. And so I'm going to work and respect my interagency process, but as the EPA representative, I know that's what I have to deliver. And so I, I, I'm a real supporter of place-based management. It is hugely important, but I come back to always trying to organize it around what's the problem I'm trying to solve and try and stay focused on that. Right here. Uh, I just want to return to what you guys were saying about uh, fishing communities. Um, both recreational and commercial anglers have been so mistrustful of the marine spatial plan, and that's probably understated. I mean, yeah. A lot of them think that Obama and Jane Lipchak are just helping get them. King uh, Obama is what they refer to him as, King Obama. 
So I'm wondering, like, what's going on there? How do we <laughs> improve our communications with those communities? Um, how do we explain things like cash share policies to those communities and the value uh, in those policies? Um. I have a very good friend who has been working in her graduate work trying to develop those communication processes. And it's very tough. She had to work almost two and a half years before there was any trust between her and the fishing community whatsoever. And that's in one area. So developing those trusts take a lot of time. And it takes showing that our progress in our, our projects are going to be beneficial to them, as well as our goals, which are creating a nice safe haven so we do have fish in the future. But it's something that takes extensive amount of time and work. They, they better work closely with the regional fisheries councils, because that, uh, I'm not saying that's the right answer, but you know, at least it's been in place for a very, very long period of time. And you have people of disparate views who've been meeting and talking about these issues forever. So I think the worst thing would be you move forward with marine spatial planning, and you're not talking to those councils and making them an integral part of how you move forward. Um, I sure hope the scientific community, though, has a much greater role in this than they do in some of the regional councils. Uh, in, in California also, the, I mean, that's, the fishermen are right there and very vociferous about their um, knowledge of the fisheries compared to the scientific knowledge of the fisheries. The, the guy down the street's a third generation drag fisherman. We argue about this occasionally. Um, there's, there's this problem of sliding baselines. You know, he thinks that there's been fish around all his life, but when his grandpappy was fishing, there were a lot more. Overfishing is undeniable. On, in, a, on a, in a scientific basis, yet many fishermen would tell me there's no problem. So th there's, a, there's a disconnect that has to be bridged. I, I would just, a couple of comments on this, and again, respective of the Aspen process. There are huge arguments as to why marine reserves and severe constraints on fishing are hugely beneficial to fishermen. In my Chesapeake Bay in the last one year, which is remarkable for any fishery, we've had an explosion of blue crabs. And if you think of the bank account analogy, the interest that they can draw down every year in a sustainable way is much larger today than it ever was. You know, last year the interest rate was 2%, and this year it's 20%, just because the base is that much bigger. And you can show time and time again that the long-term economic benefits for fishermen far exceeds what they're losing right now in the short term. But getting fishermen in particular, in any constituency, to look long term when they can't get food on the table for their kids this year or they're fighting a regulatory agency for days at sea closure is very, very hard. Or but they we've got to keep trying. Or they don't want to give up their favorite spot. But you've got to keep trying. And in the end, bluntly, you're going to have to perhaps just do some things over their objections sometimes. It's just so I have no a, a crazy little comment about that. Why don't we put fishermen back to work in different areas? How about having them go out and collect derelict nets for money? We, we actually do that. Government subsidized net money program. No, the government, NOAA shells out. I mean, last year they do yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars a year of that. Right. It's not particularly sustainable. Amy authorized we're me to go these. right here in, in Orange. And I know Amy had, <laughs> we're going to go first here and then Amy. So, um, <laughs> Sanjin with the Nature Conservancy. So, you know, I think you guys are all sort of circling around that issue. And I think you all have a sort of intrinsic um, unhappiness with even the words you're using, like marine spatial planning and marine protected areas and things like that. Because I think you are acknowledging, and, and in reference to your question as well, you know, we, we know the science behind the fish, but we really are very, very much in the, in the dark ages when we talk to people and figure out how to bring them into it. I mean, the, the ones that have been successful in California are long-term dialogues with people that slowly move them to the table. Um, you know, the Nature Conservancy working with lots of other people in the Monterey Bay, you know this, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, in, in, in um, Morro Bay, um, leased out a whole bunch of uh, trawlers. We, we essentially owned the largest trawler fleet there because we bought the leases out from them and then put the fishermen back to work as a step towards, you know, um, a long-term plan for their livelihoods. But I think when we talk about this, we don't talk about opportunities for, for people who are very much invested in it we tend to talk about how to protect places for fish. And I think in that, in that conversation, really, people really feel left out of it. And I think people feel, when you're a local and you're worried about it, whether you're in Costa Rica or Indonesia or in California, the thing that you hate most is feeling like you don't have a stake at the table, that your voice is not being heard. And, and as long as we, as long as we don't appreciate that, really, really appreciate that deeply and believe it deeply in, within our own community, I think we're going to be ineffective. Do you 
it's not to pacify them, but it's truly trying to get them there and giving, really giving them a voice. You know, the, the Marine Life Protection Act um, situation in Southern California is an interesting thing. Our group is partnering with Surge's group, and, and pretty much every group in Southern California has coordinated around it and, and dropped a lot of other stuff to try to make this happen to get the MPAs um, set up in Southern California. And I have to admit, in, in, a lot of it was communications work, and in, 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 in the real focus wasn't on we're losing our fish. It was really more on Cal Southern California is all about protect. This is what makes us special: is is the the Southern California coast and the waters off our coast. And this is no different um, from you know protecting a Yosemite or protecting some other special place. Um, and that's really been the focus is in the, in that regard. And we've had a little bit more success. I'm not saying it's great, and it's really been more for the general public. Um, and getting them on board, and also the subsistence fishing community who's on the piers, or you know, they're they're going out there and fishing all the time for their meal, and they've seen how it's changed from just the last 20 years, let alone generation to generation. They're buying into that argument, but I'm telling you, the biggest thing I, I'm upset about is that um, the the fact that the sport fishing community and the commercial fishing community, which shouldn't have as much in common um, as they do, they're lockstep together. And that shows you that we're not doing it as well as we need to do because the sport fishing community's impact, not, notwithstanding the commercial fishing side of sport fishing, which you know can be quite substantial on the impacts, but the, the smaller guys going out on kayaks or spear fishing or, or shore fishing or those sorts of things, they're, they're with the commercial guys who are you know out there with 80 squid boats and all that stuff. And it's, so we're not doing it right. And we need to rethink that communication strategy. I want to add something before Just we go very, to the next question. Very briefly, um, that work is hugely important. And there's a lot of community-based fisheries that can be far better managed by having these kind of dialogues. There's examples not just in California, certainly the Coral Triangle around the world. But I would argue if you look at the big biomass coming out of the oceans, it's not about communities. It's about, frankly, some very large companies. In the United States, the Pollock fishery and the Menhaden fishery are the two biggest by far. Um, this is the fish sticks at McDonald's and the fish that goes ground up into, you know, aquaculture and all this. Globally, you know, if you talk to anybody in West Africa, these are the European fleets that are coming to take their fish. It, it's not so, this is important conversations to happen, but in the end, these decisions, I think, are going to be made by elected officials today who know what the right answer is. And it's about trying to find a way to get the politics right to get that answer right. So Amy, I promise, next, and then I, I'm trying to watch the hand, so we'll go with Amy first. Uh, thanks. Um, I think someone said that the core goal of marine spatial planning is protecting ecosystems, but I doubt that the Navy or the Coast Guard would see yes. that way. And given all of the, uh, and others, and given all of the different federal laws that are out there that you've described, I'm wondering two things. One, you know, how will this policy interact or be overlaid with existing federal law? which has very different conflicting mandates, and as you all know, you know interpreting is part, it has been a, a very torturous interagency process and, and fights all the way to the president in some cases. Um, so how will this be overlaid? Will the White House be leading this? What's the process to make sure that it's really, you know, actually looking at the interactions of these different laws and making some new interpretations? And I also wonder, will it be a process to identify areas for potential amendment? of laws? Um, very, very briefly, um, it will be led by the White House. Um, as you know, all executive orders are written with this. Um, the lawyers, White House counsel put it the last paragraph, nothing in this order shall um, affect any statutory authorities of any agency. And that what it really reflects is the, the interest of the president as to how these agencies should interpret the law. I fully expect we're going to have all of the same um, interagency conflicts, but hopefully there will now be a process to resolve those, and that's what we can hope. In terms of the congressional side, Amy, you know, back when you were on the Hill, we actually did reauthorizations. I, you know, it doesn't happen anymore, and it's a sad comment. You know, we had the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Act, which was remarkable change, and it truly ended overfishing. You know, hopefully this gets implemented right in the United U.S. waters, but the last environmental law since then was 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. You know, it just doesn't happen. The world, the world is a lot more complicated today, and, and I will see. Maybe I hope I'm wrong. We're okay. There's a big one. I'm gonna go, David, and then the woman in the purple, and you have a question too. Chuck, this is probably, the room. probably for you, but anyone can answer it. Uh, 
You know, I, I, I'm not from the ocean uh, conservation community, but I have always been wondered about, you know, the incremental 10-year commitment to get a, a small, crazy quilt of MPAs over time just seems like uh, a Sisyphusian type of effort. And I'm wondering, on the large-scale ocean that you were mentioning, um, do, so if marine spatial planning and ecosystem-based management have a future on a larger temporal and a larger spatial scale, does the law of the seas help or hinder it doesn't speak to it bluntly. Um, the good news is that um, so many progressive nations are running with this. You know, you look to Australia, Canada, places with large EEZs, they're, they're in the midst of very aggressive, um, what I would call marine reserve oriented um, pre protection programs. Um, you've got some initiatives happening in countries which is hats off to them, say in the Latin bloc, you know, whether or not they'll actually be enforced or achieve anything. You know, this is the traditional case where a lot of it, I hate to say it, is on paper reserve, um, which leaves me a little question. So there's a lot happening throughout the world which is very encouraging. There's a huge hole though policy wise, and that's the high seas. You know, 64% of the world's oceans is the high seas, um, basically owned by no one, exploited by everyone. One, um, and there are not really any credible mechanisms to deal with that except for these different institutions like these regional fisheries management organizations, some of which are doing little no-take areas. You know, there's been a couple in the North Atlantic recently. There's a couple talking about in Camelar. So there's some hope for that. But outside the borders in the U.S. EEZ, I'm, I'm actually a little more encouraged by what I've seen in recent years. It's not enough. Just to put a little bit of his comments into perspective, less than 1% of our world's oceans are protected, and 12%, we have 12% of reserves on land. So when we think about what we, what we value and what we think is important to us, we have to keep in context that the ocean is our, our life source. We get most of our world's oceans uh, oxygen supply from the ocean, about 80%, somewhere 80 to 85%. We get our world's carbon supply from the ocean. We have a large percentage of the nitrogen. So when we think about what we're protecting, we need to reorganize our thoughts and make sure that we put in enough effort to increase those areas so that it's still there to protect us. Go straight ahead. Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm a NOAA Sea Grant Fellow in Congress. And um, so I think a lot of Americans have seen the Ken Burns special, and a lot of Americans, if you ask them, they will agree that national parks are sort of America's best idea. And we have these 14 places in the in coastal areas called National Marine Sanctuaries that are spatial set-asides, presumably for conservation. And I guess my question is, what do you see as the future of these National Marine Sanctuaries as coastal marine spatial planning starts to be implemented? Do you see them as ways to mobilize public interest as, as national parks? Do you see them as turning to marine reserves and be places for science? or? What role do you think national marine sanctuaries can play in this new national ocean policy? I don't think that they're inconsistent at all with the, the new policy, but the new policy will certainly have to probably change some of the rules in marine sanctuaries. I'm most familiar with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is great. And it uh, sounds like we're protecting the ecosystems, doesn't it? But fishing is not on the table. It's not discussed. It's not addressed. So fishing's fine. I have to get a permit to do research to take a sediment core this big, to take you know enough sediment to fill this glass, but a drag trawler can go and drag a trawl with no, with no problem. So there's some problems with that sanctuary system. We yeah, I, think, I mean, think about it. You, you got the national park system. I mean, can you, you know, notwithstanding what happens at Yellowstone, I guess, but you know, you're not supposed to just go in there and start hunting, you know, and that's certainly not the the way the National Marine Sanctuaries Program. Has, has worked. It's been more, okay, there's not going to be any new exploitation of that area. And that, it's been incredibly effective in that regard. But from the standpoint of reaching its potential or informing, for example, the Marine Life Protection Act process in California, it really hasn't. I mean, the good news is Channel Islands and, and Monterey Bay went first. So I guess in that regard, it, it helped in, 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 to some extent. But it's not one of those things where um, the, the full potential of what it could be we're just not there, and, and I think that's a very admirable thing, admirable thing to push for as part of this, is to raise the level and make them true marine sanctuaries rather than paper ones like they largely are right now. It, it'll help. Uh, it's great that they're there, and I think it's, it's, they're a good idea too. One very telling story, and I, I think I can say this even though the camera's rolling. Um, 
the sanctuaries are great. I think a lot can be done with that program, but they're not sanctuaries, as, as you've heard here. Um, when the Northwest Hawaiian Islands decision was coming to the White House to create a sanctuary for the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, this was actually created by Congress, the process, in the context of the National Marine Sanctuary Program. They did a lot of outreach for Hawaiians. They spent many, many years coming up to this. And then the final decision came, and the recommendations were coming forward to make this a no-take marine reserve. And they could not get NOAA and the National Marine Sanctuary Program to ultimately make the recommendation that they wanted. The White House wanted to go a different place. The White House, in the end, said, fine, the heck with you. I'm creating a monument. And it was really they were trying to drag the sanctuary program along, I would argue, ultimately decided they couldn't do it. It wasn't worth the time and went and created a, a, a national monument. That was Sylvia kicking somebody. That was. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the Southern California case is really important because it happened, the, the politics evolved so quickly and got fused with this sort of Tea Party, sort of anti-Obama thing, you know. And so this, it, it is a very, very important case because a lot of us have a lot of experience in the environmental community working with the fishing community. My staff member on the MLPA actually worked in the fishing industry. Surf writer has Joe Giever, who's not on the MLPA process, but he was a fisherman and, and a surfer. But um, I, I think the critical thing is what we realized playing politics because at some level the fishing industry, as Mark knows, just said there ain't no dialogue and they ended up suing us. They ended up suing all of us. But they, they and I, I had a conversation on the, my, across my office on a fishing pier and this guy who's a fisherman is all of a sudden defending the bait fishing industry, which is basically one family in all of San Diego County who got the MPA that's going to be off my beach exemption for bait fishing and he's like defending them thinking, why are you in bed with these guys who have nothing to do with you? But what we realized was that we have to play politics as well. And what we've done is create an alternative sort of uh, frame about the ocean. And we said, you know what, 50% of our state is, are, is basically Latino. And ultimately, almost no Latino communities have been involved at all in this, in this Southern California Marine Life Protection Act policy. So what does that say about civil rights and social justice? And that's been a very effective tool for talking with Antonio Villaraigosa, the, the mayor of LA, who supported the MLPA process, and the, the most uh, strongest political leadership in the state who are Latino. So um, ultimately, what we have to realize is that, and I'm going to say this, I've been working with fishermen for a long time, close to 20 years. Fishermen do not own the ocean. They do not own our coastline. They're a very small percentage of our population. And I do eth think ethically it is very important to work with fishermen in small resource-dependent communities. But in urban areas like Southern California or maybe the Northeast, the fact is there are lots and lots of communities, including my children and our grandchildren, who need to have access to this resource. And we've got to de develop a very different way of talking about the ocean. I know I'm t preaching the converted. I know that. But do you have questions? We have to learn how to play politics just like the fishermen do and involve new constituencies in articulating a new vision for the ocean. Because the fact is we all own this amazing resource that fishermen do not have sole and exclusive access to. I'd, I'd like to make a quick comment on that. I was giving a talk and someone said to me, Andrea, why do you keep preaching to the same crowd? right with what you're talking about. So I went back to the, the board and I started thinking, OK, so what am I going to do? So I started doing outreach at swap meets. I made all of my media into Spanish and English. And you'd be amazed at people who have never heard about marine debris or how they can impact their environment. And they're very concerned about it. And they'll come back and they'll hear what we have to say. And they'll bring back their entire family and reteach them everything we've taught them. So you're right. We are missing a big portion of our community when we're doing outreach. We started a little bit late, so we're going to keep it going. I do want to make sure. I know there was a question here and one here. I just want to make sure question starting from here for the panelists. So and then go oh, um, I'm Ed Barry with the Sustainable World Initiative. And we kind of frame the issue like this. In NEPA clearly called for preserving resources for future generations. The idea of balancing was in there. And yet, 30, 40 years later, we really have no one in the government that is responsible for, you know, as part of their job description, to answer the question, is the nation on an environmentally sustainable course? And that's one thing we're working toward, is to try to get that into the job description somewhere in the national government. So I guess my question is, who within the marine community of activists and uh, political advocates, if you will, should we work with uh, together collaboratively? The short answer is that would probably be CEQ. Um, you know, um, well, we're working with the CEQ, but I mean, who are the experts within the marine? Jane Lubchenco would be a good, she's head of yeah. NOAA and she's an eminent marine ecologist at the same time and also 
is an activist on these issues. Yeah, but one of the challenges, and Jane is a dear friend, and I love her to death. She is everything he says. But um, with the camera rolling, the cluster blank, you know what I'm going about to say. That's what happens in the federal family. You know, you have a meeting on oceans, and you have every single agency showing up, which is why this policy was so important to put somebody in charge. And that person in charge is Nancy Sutley, another Californian uh, in charge of CEQ. I can think of two people that, one who's not here, that you should really work with, Sylvia Earle, who's just the most amazing spokeswoman for our oceans, and Jean-Michel Cousteau. He spent his entire life, his family spent their entire lives fighting for our oceans, and they both can sit down with just about anyone in the world and have a conversation, have a dialect. You got a question over here? Yeah, uh, first uh, a brief comment there. <laughs> We're told horrible stories about uh, uh, overfishing uh, on the high seas. Uh, for the record, it's only 7% of the world fishing issues uh, on the high seas. And the rest is happening uh, in the areas under national jurisdiction. So that you have overfishing, it's not because you are fish outside, but it's within your jurisdiction. Uh, my question is, uh, I was fascinated by this discussion about difficulties that uh, you experience in the United States about this ecosystem-based management approach and implementation of policy and failure of enforcement mechanism. So the question is, how do you plan to do it at the regional level? I don't say anything about global, because if you apply ecosystem-based management approach only in the areas under your jurisdiction, that would not make much difference. So with all the difficulties that you explain, what are our chances to have it at, at least at the regional level? I think that's why you've heard from Chuck and myself, the degree of cynicism that we've had is that, um, you know, we've been involved on sort of, you know, me on the outside, him on the inside, trying to um, deal with these issues. Um, you know, these aren't, these aren't new issues, and that's, that's our biggest concern is that this is a Herculean task. I, I, I love the optimism of Jim because I think Jim is taking the long view, right, which is saying, Maybe these plans are, are, are just the start, and, and maybe we're not going to figure it out for the next five years. Maybe it'll be 10 and beyond then, um, and that's the way it has to go. It's just from our own experience, uh, in, unless there are true implementation mechanisms, whether there's from the standpoint of command and control, like enforcement, using the legal authority, um, or whether or not there's uh, economic incentives to do the right thing that are put in place, um, those are the sorts of things that need to be done. It can't just be these are great ideas and a plan. It just we've seen time and time again it just does not function that way. Um, and so the, that, I'm, I apologize, but that's where the cynicism is coming from. Is that is that conceptually having an ocean policy is new, but the idea is in marine spatial planning and doing it on such a large region is new for the United States. Um, but they're definitely building on, on concepts that have been used, whether it's in the forestry area or, or, or whether it's been used um, in much smaller areas in, in individual estuaries. Um, and it, it's a Herculean task that's going to be very, very difficult because everybody has their own individual stake that they're going to try to protect. Um, and remember, we've only talked about the fisheries side of thing. We haven't even talked about resource extraction or oil drilling and, you know, one region saying, hey, let's drill the hell out of this area and another region saying, no way. You know, so we haven't even touched that part of it, which could be as contentious as the fish. Well, you know, I would just say that it's going to be difficult. I agree with all of that. But you can't start unless you start with marine spatial planning. <clears throat> I think that's a key to move forward because if you're just going to treat it as an ad hoc basis, so we've got a problem here or there, let's treat that specifically then there is no comprehensive plan. And if you ever want to get there, and it may take 100 years, you've got to start with some sort of spatial planning. Yeah, but my question is that, for example, you have LMAs that identify that they don't recognize boundaries. You know, that's a tough one. And you know, I agree. Those are really difficult, because if, you, if your ecosystem extends from the East Pacific to the West Pacific, that is not something the US is going to be able to manage. But so there's, this will not work completely. But this is definitely a step. If we can move to marine spatial planning, it's a step forward. One comment I would make on that, I don't know the West Coast at all, but the East Coast for fisheries in, in state jurisdictional waters, we have the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and there was new federal authorities, again, back in Amy's time, given that says that if any one state doesn't implement its management plan, the federal government does have the authority to issue a moratorium on fishing for that species in that state. And that has been a huge enforcement mechanism. And so that's a fisheries example. Um, there there are other federal examples I'm familiar on the pollution side, but this is going to be a challenge, is how do we actually have the enforceable mechanism to make it work? So people will indulge us for a second. I think there were two hands here. I'll go with the khaki and then with Sam afterwards. Coming to you from the 
publicism as a terrestrial journalist, primarily I'm kind of at a loss of kind of who to look to occasionally. At the same token of your question, who to look to nationally, as far as asking questions about what's happening from a perspective globally, do I, it, for instance, in the Gulf, you know, we get reports on what's happening to our shores, but as far as one particular body that can answer to say what's happening in Mexico or toward maybe towards the Caribbean or just somewhere else, is there a global commission of alliances of NOAA and other organizations, UNEP, that can actually answer to the global connectivity of, of, of ocean questions? Is there a body for that? Um, I guess ostensibly it would be the UN Law of the Sea Convention and the debate that happens every year through a great process called Unicpolos, which uh, for those of you that aren't w wizards in the UN speak, it stands for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea Polos. Uh, help me out here, Amy. Anyway, it's, um, they spend, they meet once a, a year for a week or so. Usually the first two days are about defining what the agenda is going to be. So I do. UNESCO is involved in this. <laughs> the answer to that is called an international environmental governance process going on right now in the United Nations. <clears throat> I'd be glad to chat with you about it. Yes. I think we have time for one more question, so go right here. Thanks. Uh, uh, for Chuck, uh, I'm starting to hear that uh, the Marine Life Protection Act of California, as it's being implemented uh, with marine protected areas, uh, um, is providing a strong platform to consider uh, third-party verification and certification of fisheries at a state level. Correct. California fisheries uh, could be certified as a, as a result of this uh, by MSC, potentially. Uh, does this new ocean policy uh, have uh, provide a platform that would allow for third-party verification, such as MSC, at a national level? Um, no, is the short answer. It doesn't, I mean, in theory, it could be incorporated into that. It's certainly not specifically addressed. Um, I do see the U.S. moving much, much more toward catch shares um, and that general approach. I think the MSC and the certification process will always exist um, going on forward. Whether or not it actually becomes a market driver, I think, remains a big question. I, I just want to add, I'm, I'm on that committee for, for the state of California. We're meeting, I think, August 1st and 2nd. And, and my big concern about it, I think it's really exciting that it's happening, but w w the certification side of it, I think it's very, very important um, because not everyone can afford MSC, um, and, and the local artisans just aren't going to do it, and it just it completely ices them out. But to come up with some sort of California certification, the same way there's been Alaskan certification, which has worked really well for them, um, I think is pretty important. What I'm really afraid of, though, is if we just do the California side, the third party, um, and ignore all the, all, all the seafood product that's coming in from elsewhere around the world, we're missing the boat. Um, and so that's something that hopefully the California experience will sort of lead to, to looking at that a little bit more. Because if it's just helping out California fishermen but not taking into account, you know, where the shrimp's coming from in China or anything like that and whether there's loss of mangroves, that's a problem. And so we, we need to look at it in a much broader view and maybe that'll happen in California. We'll see. It's just starting. So I want to thank the panelists, first of all, for a really, really interesting uh, and illuminating discussion. And I hope that you will grab them, because I know there were a lot more hands popping up, and we've gone over on time. And we could probably talk about this for several more hours. So since we're all going back to lunch, maybe grab them on the way and see if you can get uh, any more of your questions answered. But thank you guys so much. Thank you, sir. Great.